So let's jump into it. My name is Stephanie, and this is the good, the bad, and the ugly of social engineering. First, I'm going to do a quick little introductory about myself. I am a Utah transplant. A lot of people wonder what brought us here. Before moving here, we were briefly in D.C., and before that in San Diego. My husband and I are both consultants, so we have the ability to pretty much move wherever we want. So we decided to play a game of chance. We narrowed it down to two U.S. cities, which was between here, and also a place hotter than hell in Arizona. And we flipped a quarter. We have been here for about a year now, and we really like it. I am a wife and a mom. I have two little boys, so the ER doctors practically know it's my name now. And my favorite hobby is special effects makeup. I really hope to one day be able to incorporate this on Etsy Pentest, where I can actually go in and create disguises, kind of elevate it, something more than just a FedEx uniform. And my kids are my biggest guinea pigs. So that's a little bit about myself. Now about my company. Since winning the black badge, I started Snow Pencil Security, which covers all aspects of social engineering. So we do OSN, vishing, phishing, physical security, and I also do security awareness training. All right, that's me and my company. Now, what are we going to be speaking about today? I'm going to be going over the good, which is my experience winning the black badge, which is one of the more prestigious awards, and it also gives me a lifetime admittance to DEF CON. I'm going to be talking about the bad, which is mistakes employees are making. I'm going to be showing you things that I see when I do my pen test. And the ugly, excuses that I hear why companies aren't actually having dedicated social engineering pen tests. I'm going to wrap it all up and show you some solutions that have helped my clients out and will hopefully help you guys out too. All right, the good. Has anyone here been to DEF CON? Okay, has anyone actually gotten to see the competition, the social engineering capture the flag? Well, yeah. All right, so before I jump into it, I kind of wanted to define what social engineering is, just so we're on the same page. Social engineering at its core is manipulation. It is manipulating people into doing or saying things that may or may not be in their best interest. All right, about the competition. The Social Engineering Capture the Flag, or I'll also refer to it as the SECTF, is held yearly at DEF CON. And what a lot of people don't realize is there's actually two phases to it. Before the live calls, there is a information gathering and reporting phase. And then whoever has the highest combined scores of both of the phases is the winner. Last year marked the five-year anniversary for having the SECTF, and they decided to kind of mix it up a little bit. Instead of it being a solo competition, they made it a tag team. So once you were chosen to compete, you received your target, um, your target, and then also you received a random teammate. And there were nine teams competing. Seven of the nine teams were female-male combinations, and then the other two were male-male. About the flags. So the flags were pretty much broken up into three categories, which was IT information, vendor information, and employee information. But when I say employee information, we weren't looking for things like their passwords or their social security card numbers. This competition, it targets the company, not its employees. So nobody was getting victimized. And then for scoring, the higher the risk, the higher reward. So something like, what's your schedule like? Maybe only five points. But if you can actually get the uh, version of the browser, that's worth 15 points. All right, any guesses what the highest value flag might be? What's something kind of malicious you guys think that we could get someone to do over the phone? No guesses? All right. Password? Well, we weren't victimizing, but that's a good guess. We were actually seeing if we can get someone to go to a specific URL. So on the phone, having them type it in. My um, teammate and I were able to do that four times during our calls. And so phase one, this is the information and gathering phase. We had four weeks to collect as many flags as we can find, but we couldn't actually go to our target company in person or call them up. We had to find it all on the line, online and document it. And for every flag we were able to find, we got half credit. And when I say open source intelligence, the way we gather things, it's information that's available online, it's public. So places like Google and social media, and even the company's own website. This is a graph I actually used in my report. It kind of breaks down the sources of how I found all of my flags. 
So about 75% was between Google and social media. And when I say social media, I was able to find a lot of information between Instagram and LinkedIn. All right, phase two. This is actually getting in the soundproof booth at DEF CON, which I have some pictures I'll show you soon. We were given 30 minutes total time to actually make our calls, to gather as much information, as many flags as we could. But one of the rules this year was no call spoofing. So if someone calls you, the first thing you do is you look to see who it is. That was working against us. Most employees know, all right, corporate is this phone number, or at least this area code. But that was already working against us. And then also, because it was a tag team, we had to tag out or just transfer the call um, at least one time during our call. And then every time we were able to transfer the call, we got an additional 10 points. OK, so 20 minutes before my scheduled time to actually make my calls. I'm texting my partner, trying to get a hold of him, and he finally replies that he is way too hungover to leave his hotel room. I was pissed. So I freaked out. I tried to get my husband to be on my team, but he was already competing, so that wouldn't work. But I didn't want to be disqualified. I had to find someone. So I was asking around, and my husband got on his phone and called one of his friends who was at the competition and said, hey, I need you here right away. So he shows up, and I explain my situation, and he decided to help me out. So we were given a few extra minutes to kind of go over our pretext, our target, and what flags we were going to be going after. So the pretext we use is the background story. It's who we were pretending to be, why we were pretending to call, and then also what flags we were trying to gather. So I already knew I was going to have red flags going off with no call spoofing. So I wanted to try to make it seem as realistic as possible. So I decided we should play stereotypical roles, I being the female, doing more of an administrative type position, and then Steve being the male, more of an IT guy. It kind of fits, I mean, no red flags. And when I was doing my um, information gathering stage, I was able to find information on each store that we called. So I found the manager's full name. I found the store number, and I also found internal lingo. So we were able to make five successful calls in our 30 minutes gathering us a lot of points. And then here's a picture of us actually in the soundproof booth. If we look scared, it's because we were. It is very intimidating. Not only is it like hot and dark, you can kind of see, you see the reflection, you see all the people sitting on the ground. This competition has become so popular at DEF CON that there's actually a line, last year there was a line, 45 minutes just to get into the competition. And this is a cool graph that I got from the DEF CON 22 Social Engineering and Capture the Flag report, just kind of showing you the total teams, and my team was the Schmooth operators. And then another graph from the same report. From high to low, it shows you which companies gave out the most information during both phases. And Pixar didn't happen. This is us at uh, DEF CON closing ceremonies getting the black badge. And then another picture. So this kind of wraps up the good, my experience with the social engineering capture the flag. So now let's move on to the bad. I'm going to show you some big vulnerabilities that I'm finding when I do my SE pen test. But first I want to clear up a common misconception. So you hear all the time that humans are the weak link, which is true. But you'll hear things like, you can't patch stupid, or users are stupid. But that's not true. People are smart. We hire them to do specific jobs because they know what they're doing but we can't expect them to know about security if we're not training them properly. All right, so when I do my SC pen test, I always start with OSINT, whether I'm doing vishing, phishing, physical security, or security awareness training. So I look and I see what information I can find and gather on these people. So when I do physical security, I look at badges. I mostly look at them so I can replicate them. I get the orientation of how the layout is, where pictures are placed, is there a logo, kind of that feel. And I also look for trappings. I look for how your employees are dressed. Is it casual? Is it formal? Things that I want to blend in. You can also see she has um, her badge on her hip. That's something I would prefer because it's further away from the eye. It's a little less, it's not in your face. And I also look if they have any additional credentials. So not only does she have a badge, she also has a name tag that has two logos, her name and her position. Another giveaway is lanyards. You want to make sure you're blending in, so you need to see if they're company lanyards or if they're personal lanyards. If I wouldn't have the time or budget to actually recreate a company lanyard, I would try to do something like 
at least get the same color and try to get the same thickness. All right, this person works in the medical field. And when you're looking at badges, you really want to pay attention to symbology. There's letters, numbers, colors, symbols, all these things on these badges, and they all have a purpose. So you can see the S on the corner by her picture. Let's just say that stood for the south wing of the hospital. So if I were to replicate this badge, I wouldn't show up in the north wing of the hospital or that you know people question me. It could mean she has access to sensitive data or maybe a secure area. And you could see it has the yellow on it. This just could be the standard, empl um, standard employee badge. Or it could mean that maybe it's she's a nurse, so it's, or, so it's yellow, or doctors have green. You want to try to find as many badges as possible so you can kind of get the general overview. All right, visitor badges. This is something else I look for. If you're going into a small company, they're going to be able to pick you out if you're trying to be pretend to be one of their employees. So this one actually has a lot of stuff going on for a visitor badge. You can see the QR code and the barcode. So you definitely want to scan those to see what kind of information they're putting out before you go try to do your pen test. This one actually has a sponsor's name. If I'm in this position, I like to use someone like the CEO or the CFO as the sponsor because nobody will question you. Nobody will mess with the CEO's guest and makes them more likely to comply if I ask them for a favor or question. This badge would not be that hard to duplicate. Again, paying attention to detail, the actual date is in the top, but the expiration date is the next day. I personally would take off the escort required because I wouldn't want an escort. And then workstation. For whatever reason, people are putting pictures of their workstations on social media sites, which I look for. And all these pictures, by the way, are things that I've found off the internet, they're not my client's pictures. But this picture is actually more of a placeholder. It reminds me of a similar story that I couldn't use the picture for. So my client, they had their company logo set for all the desktop pictures. And do you guys know the decal of the bad boy peeing on something? It's only like a different, like Ford or things like that. So he cropped the picture of the bad boy peeing onto the company logo, and he took a picture just like this and posted it on Twitter. Or no, it's Facebook. So a couple days later, I found this picture. So I spoofed my number and called him from my team. I explained that my boss was pissed, and he's going in and changing settings. So as he's scared, he's more likely to comply. So I say, since, I have you, since you've messed with settings, we need to kind of go over and do a quick audit to make sure you haven't changed anything else crazy. For whatever reason, this person took a picture of their Outlook. <laughs> I, still, I don't even know why. Like, the hashtag was workflow. So I, what I would do if this was, yeah. So what I would do is I would get all the information on here, which is their vendor, what they're ordering. In the bottom, you can see the account number, all this information. And I would call up this employee and spoof myself as the vendor and get as much information as I could out of them. This guy is an actual government contract employee. He thought he was taking a picture of his cool, healthy-ish lunch. It's healthy because it's true for your I guess. And what he didn't realize is what he left was his VPN credentials. This was on Facebook, guys. His VPN credentials. <sighs> okay, so I also look for vendors. There's a reason why vendors are a whole category in the social engineering um, capture the flag. And the reason why we look for vendors, like let's say Best Buy was my client. I want to see who's associated with them so I can replicate their uniform. Or I want to see, um, I want to see companies who are bragging, like these are all my employees. So not only can you duplicate their uniform, you can use this information for vishing or phishing. My last client, I was able to find 10 of their vendors. So in addition to janitors or pest control like this company, there's also lawyers, food service, vending machine companies, Trash companies, even shred it. What if I found out someone used shred it? I could duplicate their uniform, show up, and think of all the information I can get just from those bins. All right, let's talk about social media. It's kind of like the workstations, different things I'm seeing people post pictures of. A lot of people like to brag on LinkedIn. So not only do you see that he's using Windows XP, he lists two different VPN clients. Think of his, if his coworker was the same guy who put his VPN credentials out there. 
No crazy hacks. And this guy wanted to take a picture of his work schedule. What I look for is vacations. I love it when people are on vacation. That gives me an in. I would show up when he was gone, explain to the receptionist that he's expecting me to bring him these important papers, and that's it. I'm in. Okay. This is what I call crazy cat lady. She wanted to show off her new magnets. Cat butts. <laughs> and she posted this to Facebook. Right next to cat butts was the SSID name and password. Just in plain sight. So as I'm going through all these, I kind of want you to think, is this information that is covered in my social, uh, or sorry, my security awareness trainings, or, or my employees or coworkers putting this information out there not realizing things that are right next to cat butts? So as I said before, people aren't stupid. They're not, they're not trained well. So this Twitter site likes to point those people out. They retweet pictures that people put up of their credit cards. And this is actually me blocking that. This isn't Twitter. People don't realize the risk involved. So for this thread, for example, someone said, oh, thanks for the information. I'm going to go shopping now. And the person replied, yeah, haha, you don't have the CCV code. But that's not true. They don't realize the risk. You can go, there's a number of sites where you don't need the CCV code. All right, let's talk about phishing. Traditional physical security, or I'm sorry, traditional tests with phishing, it's not really social engineering. There's no back and forth communication. You just send out an email and see how many people will click a link or how many people will download something. So this is kind of a story that's been, um, a big fish that's been going around, the ACH transaction. It's been big for about two years now. So what these bad guys do is they send out emails to your coworkers, to your employees. And what they're looking for is they're getting a sense of their writing style, their signature, do you go by any nicknames, as much information as they can. Then they create this fake email thread, which is pretty much from the CEO to the CFO, and it's going back and forth. And it starts with like, I'm so excited we got this new vendor, and you can kind of see them going back and forth for a little bit. And then one of the last emails would be from the CEO saying, Hey, I just talked to these guys. They haven't gotten paid. They're pissed off. What's going on? We need to get this taken care of. So the CFO will actually take this whole thread and email it to someone in accounts payable and say, I need this amount of money to go to this account as soon as possible. And most of the time they do it. So that's a really big fish that's going on right now. That's more of a social engineering one. Okay, vishing. Also known as voice phishing, but it's pretty much social engineering over the phone. For one of my clients, I was using the pretext I was calling from IT, so I needed their phone number so I was able to spoof it. I couldn't find it online, so I thought maybe I can just call the receptionist and get the phone number. Before finishing my sentence, she just transfers me to help desk. So Andrew answers the phone. And I explained to him, oh, I'm sorry, I think I might have gotten the wrong number. What number is this? So that way I had the number. And he said, hold on, I'm new. And I like wanted to pause the phone so I could squeeze for a second. I love new people and interns. They give me the most information. So once he got back on the phone and gave me the number, I went on to say, my computer's acting crazy, and my boss said, just call IT and figure out what they're using so you know to mimic it and use the same stuff. He was so excited to help me. He spent 10 minutes in detail going over all the software and versions, and he said, make sure you're using Internet Explorer 9 because Internet Explorer 10 is wonky with some of our stuff. So we ended the call with him actually giving me the SSID and wireless password because apparently I was on the wrong one. All right. I have a lot of clients who want to see if I can just get passwords. That's just strictly what percentage of their employees will give me their password. So I made my list of names and numbers I was going to be calling. And I got to one particular employee. And I like getting passwords because not only, like, is it a challenge, it's also kind of funny what people have their passwords as. So I go through my whole pretext of we ran patches, and it looks like your computer didn't receive the patch. I'm going to have to be working overtime on the weekend just so when you come in Monday, everything's going to be fine. And so I said, I just need your login credentials so I can get this done so you'll be able to work just fine on Monday. So he's quiet which makes me nervous when people are quiet. But before I can open my mouth and explain 
keep going, seeing what I can get out from him, he, sa- he starts to whisper, I have people in the room, and my password contains profanities. <laughs> so I, you know, tried not to laugh. And then I said, let me just walk you through how to change your password, so that way it's something you feel comfortable. So not only is it funny to see what people have their passwords as, it's funny to see what they'll change them to when they think that they're going to be giving it to IT. So he changed his password to, I love my job 13. <laughs> So that was actually a learning experience for me. From that last client, I was able to get 59% of passwords. But I realized people aren't comfortable telling you their password. A lot of times they're personal things or their grandma's names or maybe they're stupid. It doesn't matter. They're not comfortable. So I changed my pretext up. Well, I used the same one with about the patch. But then I said, let me explain to you how to change it. So once I did that on the next client, I was able to get 78% of passwords. All right, physical security. Who here is a Whovian? Oh, come on, more hands. Come on, guys. <laughs> All right. So for those of you who don't know, this is a psychic paper trick. This is just a blank piece of paper that the doctor carries around with him through time and space. And any time he gets questioned, he pulls this out. So if someone wants to know who he is, he pulls it out, and they kind of project who they think he should be. Well, this is my version of that trick. At the time, I didn't realize I was doing it until I was explaining it to a friend. And she's like, oh, you just did the psychic paper trick. So for my client, they wanted to see if I could access, um, get in through telegating and things like that, but they also wanted to see if I can make it to, through a secure floor on their building. So I get in through telegating and whatnot, so I make it to the um, certain floor. I keep walking, I smile at the guard and keep walking. He says, hey, you need the form. I was like, shit, what form? So as confident as I could... I have a mom purse. I mean, it's full of crap. It's full of fruit snacks and forms, luckily. So I pulled it out, and the first thing I saw was kindergarten registration forms. So I just folded it up, put it, you know, and I was talking to him, making small talk, and I just kind of, yeah, it's right here. I did it so he can kind of see a couple fields, and I was on my way. So that's my psychic paper trick. Telgating. So social engineers like to play to human nature. I know if I'm coming at you with a box of something, you're probably going to hold the door open for me. But I know if I'm coming at you with a box of donuts, you'll probably ask me for one as you're holding the door open. So I have to make sure there's actually donuts in the box. But if I were to give someone one, they're more likely to help me out later with a favor. I wish it was this easy sometimes. Sometimes tailgating and picking locks doesn't work. So I kind of created my own version of this. Does anything look weird with this picture other than the missing core? What about now? So this is how I added a UV marker and a black light to my kit. So when nobody's around, I just take the marker and make the stripe down. Give it a couple, um, I just wait till a couple people come in and out. And then I take my flashlight and I see which ones are the marked off. I go back to my car and I make a list of possible choices it could be. So that's kind of my version of Finding those. All right, let's talk about the ugly. These are excuses that I'm hearing companies make why they don't have dedicated social engineering pen tests. They are because it works, we have a yearly security awareness training in place, or because it's too expensive. And this is my response. They don't make sense at all. So let's break it down. Because it works. So you're telling me because social engineering works, you're not going to train against it? Or don't you want to know how it works so you can train your employees things to look out for? Or we have a yearly security awareness training already. Security awareness training suck. They are so bad. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But you're spending all of this money on a mandatory security awareness training. It's just a check in the box. And then that brings up the next point of spending money. So some companies are really expensive, that's true. But how much did you pay for your security guards, for your cameras, for special locks? Add all that up, how much did you spend on it? Don't you want to validate it? Shouldn't you test it to see if there's any vulnerabilities? Also, to get the most out of your money, I think you should do a hybrid approach, which is not only having your external yearly test, but constantly be doing internal tests. And solutions. These are things that have helped some of my clients in the past. So, to protect all of your technology, you have IDS, firewalls, and the list goes on and on. But what about people? You can't super glue a firewall to a person's head. 
unfortunately. So what about people? How do we protect people? How do you patch a person? Let's take it from nature. How do we prevent, pre, sorry, prevent disease? We vaccinate. We slowly introduce the disease to the person's body to build immunity. And this guy right here is Edward Jenner. He created the first vaccine in the late 1700s. I'm not saying find some H1 cyber one and inject all of your employees. I'm saying constantly be doing things to keep them security minded. Constantly be testing them. It's not just a once a year thing. So with testing, have teachable moments. This in itself will create such a lasting memory with them. It's a mini training. So after I gather a password, I, sit, I explain to someone, hey, I'm a good guy. I could have easily been a bad guy. This is what you did wrong, and this is what you showed you. And then when you test social engineering, make sure you're testing all aspects. You can't just test phishing. What if the bad guys are getting in through physical security? You need to see where your vulnerabilities are. OK, and then your security awareness training sucks. It's bad. It's distracting. It's not engaging. Everyone here has to take it. It's mandatory. So just think about the last time you took it. You're sitting at your desk. Your email's going off, your boss is calling, your wife is texting you to bring home diapers. The list goes on and on. You're distracted. It's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Different companies have different vulnerabilities. So what they should have, they should be in person. You need to be away from distractions. You also need to have real-life examples shown. So like all those pictures I showed you, you need to have those in your security awareness training so people can realize, oh, I'm not supposed to do this. And you also need to empower your employees to say no. They need to feel like if they get suspicious of a caller that you'll have their back. You need to have the CEO up there saying, hey, if you hang up on someone, that's OK. If you feel comfortable, that's all right. Don't give them information. And this is kind of the framework or lifestyle that life cycle that's helped some of my employees. So you have your external pen test once a year. And then off of the risks, you create a customized training so they can see examples of what they're doing wrong. But also, internally, you need to be testing. You need to be doing training off of more vulnerabilities. So that's constantly going on. All right, so let's do a quick recap. I talked about the good, which is my experience with the social engineering capture of the flag. I talked about the bad. I showed you examples of things people are putting out there that they shouldn't be. I also talked about the ugly, some excuses that we hear. And I showed you solutions. So this is how we change culture. We need to make our employees immune to this. It has to be just second nature to them. So constantly testing. They need to know internal testing is going on as well. All right, so what's going on with me in the future? I'm actually doing a social engineering 101 training. This is going to be at Circle CityCon in June. And it's free, kind of. You just buy a ticket to get in. And all the trainings are free. So it's just a four-hour four hour course. And I'm going to be going on over information gathering. So I'm going to show you how I found those pictures. Pretext building, elicitation techniques, so getting people to say yes or give you information, and how to read body language. I'm also developing a physical security tool. Like I said before, sometimes lock picking or tailgating won't work. So this will help with that. I don't want to get into it too much because it's still being developed. And I'm also working on a research project. This is a foot in the door technique. This is a part of reciprocation. So how I use this in social engineering is I'll show up to your receptionist and I'll explain um, how I'm lost and ask if she can give me directions to maybe another company that's close by. So that's like a small request. I'm kind of asking for directions. And then I'll maybe ask for another small request. And that leads to a big request, which would be, hey, I have this interview. I'm running late. Do you mind printing off my resume? Here's my USB. Rubber ducky. So that's how the foot in the door technique would work. Sorry, guys, I talked really fast. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming and listening. If you guys have any questions, I'll be hanging around. Thank you so much. <laughs>